and make it say anything you want. And uh, we're going to actually talk about that tonight because there's a scripture here um, that if you read the scripture, just the scripture, not the context, not what they're talking about around it, um, you would be very confused. Um, it's, it's the same thing as we get to a scripture that we're going to go to in Corinthians where it says, uh, does not the very nature of things tell you that if a man has a long hair, it's a disgrace. It says that. So you're like, what? Okay. Well, what about the Levites? What about Samson? Of course, Samson was trouble. Uh, so all the long-haired people in the Bible got in trouble. But, uh, but the Levites, they couldn't cut their hair. So they're like, okay, well, does it contradict itself? No, that's not, that's not the point. It's, uh, so there's context, and that's what's important uh, tonight as we get into the study in Romans. And uh, the title, so we're going to talk about several different things, but two of the main things is when, when convictions collide. Uh, and, and I hadn't the thought until I think when I went home and kind of looked over my notes again, uh, that when convictions collide, it's a lot like a marriage. You know, when you get two people that when you're dating, there's a lot in common uh, because that's what you focus on is what we like, what we do. We have the same song and we have the same whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and in the dating process, sometimes you'll lie about things you're interested in because you know, you know they're interested in it. And so you kind of pretend like you, know, you might dress in camo and you've never touched a gun in your life. You've never hunted and you love Bambi. That's your favorite show. Um, and you're a vegan. Um, yeah, and, uh, and you're going to wear camo because he likes to hunt just to, to try to impress. And, and you pretend to like, you know, tearjerker movies or, yeah, then, yeah, and, you know, and you're wiping the tears away. And she thinks it's romantic, and you just am glad that it's over. <laughs> That's why you're crying. Um, and so in a marriage, you know, you have two people that get together that are imperfect. Um, expectations are high. And let me, let's just be honest. All of us had high expectations when we got married, too high. We had expectations, whether you knew it or not, that the per person was never going to hurt your feelings and always be the first to apologize. And, you know, um, in, in our home, the rule is the one who's most mature apologizes first. So, um, yeah, that's a race. <laughs> that's actually a teaching of Andy Stanley. That's not mine. Um, but I love that. The mature one apologizes first. Well, that, that makes you want to apologize first, right, because you want to be seen as the mature one. Um, but when convictions collide in the church, it can create a lot of problems, and that's what Paul is addressing here. Um, again, as we talked about it last week, if, if you weren't here, that, that Rome was full of a bunch of Gentiles. Gentiles were non-Jews. Um, basically, heathens ran after pagan gods, sexually immoral, drunkards. I mean, it was a crazy, crazy place. And then you had the Jewish culture who lived the law. I mean, they lived Old Testament law, their eating habits, what they ate and what they didn't eat, when they could eat it. I mean, they, they were all like very law-driven. So you have a very law-driven group of people that come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then you have the Romans who have no laws. It's like, hey, whatever you want to do, do. They come to faith in Jesus Christ, and then you marry them in the same church. And, and it causes problems because, you know, the Jews are going, whoa, what are you eating pork chops for? And... And Roman's like, dude, pork chop, <laughs> I'll call you pork chop. I love pork chop. You ever had pork chops? I mean, um, and so you have these conflicts that have nothing to do with salvation, but everything to do with doctrine and belief and just everyday life. And so, um, again, it's like two people getting married that you're just going to have collision of, con of convictions. You know, you might um, say, you know, we don't have any movies with any swearing. And, and you'd be like, well, what's wrong with that? You know, well, we can't watch this movie. Um, I'm very fortunate. I live with a wonderful woman who her conviction is you shouldn't have a TV in your bedroom. Now, if you all do that, that's, that's you. But our thing is, is, is we don't have a TV in the bedroom because it's, you know, we don't need a TV in the bedroom. Let's just not go any further than that. Um, okay, there should be enough other stuff going on, um, sleeping and other things um, in your bedroom. And, and the you know, and so that's not a fight. But I had, I knew a, a, some good friends of mine who she couldn't go to sleep without the TV on and it kept him awake. And so there was this conflict, you know, and my thing was, well, cut the cord off and throw it out the window. <laughs> you know, he was trying to honor her she, and she was like, I kind of, and they, they loved each other. It was just differences of how they grew up. Um, and so anyhow, there's just things that happen in our Christianity that can cause problems. Um, and that is when convictions collide, which we'll, we'll get, get a little more into that. And then the topic um, here, and this is really important, is, is how do I judge without being judgmental? That, that is one thing that we have to, you know, hear people all the time. Well, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Well, we're going to see in scripture, Paul actually says, are we not to judge those inside the church? 
okay? Now, the, the word judgment isn't bringing the gavel down, sentencing the person, but it is judging fruit. It's judging behavior. So how can I judge behavior without being judgmental as a person? And that's the balance that we have to, uh, to find in our lives. Um, I wrote here, we simply can't have an anything goes attitude when it comes to behaviors. We can't say, well, I don't wanna be judgmental, so I'm not gonna call you out on it. Um, we judge all the time. Right? We judge who our kids are hanging out with. We judge whether we like food or not. Okay? We judge, and I, I, Travis has this funny, and he might be listening tonight. He has this funny thing of telling me that what I eat is gross. <laughs> like I'll be eating, sour, he doesn't like sour cream. So he's like, that's just gross. That's just gross. I'm like, why are you judging my eating habits? <laughs> I mean, what gives you the right to judge what I like or don't like? Well, that's just gross. And so I took a video of myself and I took a big spoonful of sour cream out of the bucket because we buy buckets of sour cream and I just ate it. And, and I sent him the videotape just for fun. Because um, I love sour, I do, I love sour cream. Um, I love cottage cheese and pineapple. I love, I, I can eat a lot of things. Tofu, I don't really care for. Um, I, 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 I have never tried tofu, I've just smelt it. And I, I yeah, I just, yeah, just <laughs> Uh, listen, when I did kids camp games, because Chris and I used to do the kids camp games at, at our at our church camps, I was in charge of of the fear factor one year, and so I bought all kinds of disgusting foods, and tofu was one of them that the kids had to actually eat. Pickled pig feet. The winner. Here's the winner. This kid got a black beetle. You know the black beetles that are around that big, and the whole the whole thing was stick it on your tongue, like like, and your team will get points. And so he did. Stuck it on his tongue, and all the kids are just going, ah! And then he ate it. He just went, crunch, <laughs> I mean, he won. I mean, it was like, no! And he was, he just chowed it down. Uh, it was bitter as all get out, but that was crazy. <laughs> all right. So personal convictions versus legalism and holiness. Uh, what I want to do is, is I want to live for God because I love him, not because I have to. You know, and, that, and that's, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, a lot of people, I think, want to obey God because that's just what you're supposed to do. But I want to obey because I love him. I want him to know there's, there's a difference between obedience to God and living for God. Because we can obey. I mean, Paul was trying to obey the law before he was really serving Jesus. Um, and the Jews tried to obey the law, but they couldn't. Okay, So there's a difference between being obedient and actually living for God. Um, a, a, I guess a illustration would be your kid if you told your kid hey clean your room and, and they cleaned it but they had attitude just throwing stuff and kicking stuff and then they're clean they're, it's technically being clean but they're just doing it with this horrible attitude um, and then you tell your kid clean your room and they're like sure be happy to okay there's a difference between obeying and living to please and I want to be the one that lives to please God all right, so why this was written by Paul, page one, um, Roman culture versus Jewish culture. Again, they collide after salvation. Um, he's just telling them, guys, you just accept each other. Um, he starts out in verse one, accept each other whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. And we'll go ahead and start reading. Uh, one man's faith allows him to eat everything. Another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. <laughs> I love how he throws that in there. He was like, you vegetarians, you're weak. You have weak faith. Um, and vegans are worse, right? I don't know, he didn't say that, but... Anyhow, uh, his faith is weak, eats only vegetables. He's not judging anybody. He's just saying there, in this culture, there were people that had a problem with eating certain meat. And so they wouldn't eat meat because it might have been sacrificed to some pagan god, which in the Jewish culture was a big no-no. And so they're, they're going, okay, I have this freedom in Jesus, but I've been taught my entire life that eating pig is bad. So what do I do with this? Um, it, even Jesus, when he, he said, you know, it's been said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. In other words, you have a right to react the way if you, someone knocks your eye out, you get to knock their eye out. If someone knocks your tooth out, you get to knock their tooth He said, you know, it's been said, eye for eye for tooth, but I tell you, turn the other cheek, forgive. Totally new teaching, okay? It's just totally opposite of what they were allowed to do. And now Jesus is saying it's a heart thing, okay? It's a heart thing. Yeah, you have the, the right to retaliate, Okay, with the woman that was caught in adultery and they drug her before Jesus and they're like, hey, we caught her in the act. You know, what's, you know, what do you say? Should we stone her? And Jesus never said you don't have the right to stone her. He said, no, you're, legally you can kill her. But whoever's got no sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. <laughs> Let's shut them up really fast. Okay, so Jesus didn't say the law isn't valid. He was just saying, why not try grace? I think it's my favorite story in the Bible, honestly. Um, because she was so guilty, and, and he, again, he looked at her, 
And he said, woman, has no one condemned you? And the, the word woman was sweetheart. I mean, that's the, the translation isn't woman. <laughs> it's, it's actually a, just a term of endearment. So here this woman who was in sexual sin um, gets caught, brought before Jesus, and Jesus just loves her. I mean, how, how cool is that? that? That is God's grace. And so if, if you've been in sin like that, that you think, how could God ever love me? He looks at you the same way. Okay, He looks at you the same way. Maybe he might say for a guy, hey, buddy, it's okay. Just don't do it again. Okay, he said he told her to quit doing it. Um, we can't stop at the forgiveness. We have to stop it. <laughs> hey, 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 knock it off, right? Hey, I forgive you, but do your best to stay out of it. Um, you know, I'm glad God is that graceful. So, okay, uh, eats only vegetables. Uh, verse three, the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. This is where we left off last week. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Uh, we'll see does so to the Lord or to the Lord three times in this section. He who eats meat eats to the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that great? With the Super Bowl coming up and food, <laughs> it's like, we well, just eat it to the Lord. Um, okay, uh, whoever eats meat he does so to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And he's just making the point here, guys, let's just get along. Let's just get along. Let's not be so judgy on what people are eating and what people are doing and what they're drinking. Um, you know, there's rules, what the Bible says, do not. And there's also things that they are just kind of gray areas. Okay, there's just certain things that, okay, it might be good for you, it might be bad for me. Uh, again, it goes back to example, like I said on Sunday. All right, so, okay, we have to be careful not to push our personal convictions on others. Um, so starting in our notes in page one, I wrote here down, uh, there's things that I was thinking of in our culture now that can be personal convictions. Um, an example, Halloween. Okay, Halloween is one of those things that, you know, some Christians are like, how dare you celebrate the, you know, the, the day, day of the devil. And, and the devil worshipers do like Halloween. It's true. Um, you know, I've, I've had a family at the first church we were at, very godly family, but they would shut all their lights off and, and hide in the basement of their house on Halloween because they didn't want to give up candy. They just, it was just like, this is the devil's day, um, you know, and I respected them for it, okay? But we also did fall festival outreaches at our church, okay? And we got along fine. They kind of got why what we were doing and, um, you know, we used to do things here, um, you know, for outreaches. And once trunk or treats became popular, the kids used to come and leave where we had, like by the time it came to the gospel message, they were all gone. So it was kind of this, just this cultural thing that shifted. Um, you know, some people hate it. Some people don't care. Some people are neutral. My, my stand, as I grew up, again, trick-or-treating. Okay, little town, we'd go trick-or-treating. To me, it was about the candy. And I never went, oh, I'm worshiping the devil. <laughs> I was a good Christian kid. Um, I had parents who were very godly people, who were very balanced. And um, so I respect if somebody says, no, Halloween. And again, if you grew up in a house of Satanism, it's going to mean something totally different than somebody that didn't. But when people really want to argue with me on this subject of Halloween, I, I, again, if, that, if you believe, don't do it, that's, that's your conviction. That's, that's, that's your prerogative, and that's fine. Um, what I tell people is I ask them this. I said, so as a Christian, if I go tr take my kids trick-or-treating, am I worshiping, the, am I truly worshiping the devil? They're not, I mean, we're not, you know, praising Satan. They're not singing satanic chants. We're not. And, and so I said, okay, so if a non-Christian celebrates Christmas, are they celebrating Jesus, truly celebrating Jesus? No. So we have this balance here. I, I'm not celebrating the devil any more than a non-Christian is celebrating Jesus by celebrating Christmas or, you know, having Christmas Day. So again, it's a convictions thing. It's, it's not a, um, obviously, I am totally against Satanism. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, would, I would promote it. I would say, you know, again, there's people that know more about it than me. Again, if you came out of a, of a, a family that did Ouija boards, then I would stay away from it. Cause, but again, it's a personal conviction thing. Um, 
And so, again, I, it's not something that should separate the church. All right, Christmas trees. There's people that have a problem with Christmas trees. Like, well, it's a, you know, that's a pagan idol. <laughs> no, it's a tree. <laughs> yeah, needles and that. Now, that is satanic, for sure. Um, real, <laughs> all right, and having to set them up and take them down. Um, so Christmas trees, some people have a big issue with it. I would say that, that if you're a Christian and you have a problem with Christmas trees, then don't have one. I mean, just... But but don't condemn me for having, how many we have, babe? Three, four? Oh, my wife disappeared. Rapture? <laughs> oh, Russ is still here. No, we're good. Um, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Unless he took ladies first. Um, but then Lexi's here, so we're fine. All right, we're good. All right. So, okay, convictions. All right, Christmas trees. Okay, red meat. Some For some people, red meat just shouldn't. You know, I love red meat. I love the verse where Jesus lowered the sheet down in front of Peter. If you've never heard the story, yeah, he says, kill and eat, man. I was like, have some steak. Uh, Peter's like, no, Lord. And he's like, you're telling me no? Don't, don't tell Jesus no. All right. Uh, Bible version. Some people get hung up on the version of the Bible that you read. You know, that, I mean, that's a big deal in some churches. Um, you know, particularly it's the King James only. I mean, that's, that's a big deal in some churches. Um, and that's okay. That's a personal conviction. I, I personally struggle reading the King James because I don't speak 16th century English. My whole thing is if you really want to be right, learn Greek and Hebrew and then just carry manuscripts and, you know, do that. So um, there's a, what are some other things? I, that, was, that was just what I thought of. What are some other things that people kind of get tripped out over in church? Saturday or Sunday. Okay, Saturday or Sunday worship. Yeah. Yeah, what, what day? Dresses and pants? I think all women should wear dresses. Dresses are pretty. I like it. It is easy for a man to say. That is true. Okay. Well, let's leave it at this. Pretty dresses are pretty. Okay. But what you think is a pretty dress might be considered ugly in somebody else. My favorite dress was Lexi's Christmas tree dress. That was so cute. Yeah. It was awesome. Um, you know, we'll say drinking wine, okay, or alcohol. That's another, that's another thing. And again, Paul says, hey, between you and God, but if it causes somebody to stumble, don't do it in front of them, you know. Um, I was listening to a pastor I like yesterday, and uh, he was talking about, because he came out of, he was a Jesus movement drug addict. I mean, he came out of the, he was a Calvary Chapel guy. And, uh, you know, his whole life was lived for the flesh. <laughs> and, and what he was saying was his staff, he says, I don't allow my staff. He said, I personally don't drink. I mean, he, he used to. I personally don't, and I don't allow my staff to. He said, because we're trying to tell people to stay out of addictions. Yeah. And if I'm, if I'm holding the bud, it's kind of hard to say, hey, you know, you don't, but I'm okay with this. So, um, again, the biblical because I'm not here to tell you what you should and should do. Look at what the Bible says about it. If you don't have a problem with it, if you're doing it in the comfort of your own home and it's not causing anybody to stumble, then it's not a sin to you, okay? For me, it would be, okay, just because it's my personal conviction, but I'm not gonna push my convictions on you, okay? I am, did you have something to say? Verse by verse or topical. Yeah, verse by verse or topical, yeah. Yeah, verse by verse, you know, some churches go through the whole entire Bible verse by verse Sunday mornings and it takes them 14 years. Um, I'm a topical preacher. I, I pray and say, God, what is our, what do we need to hear this week? Um, and I typically have my, about a week in advance. Um, I know what I'm, because I used to like wait till Saturday because I was really spiritual. I'm just gonna hear from God. And Saturday night I'm going, God, I didn't hear nothing. God's like, you didn't prepare. <laughs> I ain't saying nothing to you, all right? You're gonna <laughs> totally fall on your face because you weren't prepared for tomorrow. Um, I just wanted to be anointed of the Lord. And uh, I've learned just because you think you're interesting does not mean you are. <laughs> <laughs> if people aren't listening, you're not interesting. And if, if, and if you're not listening and learning, I'm not doing my job. It's not the crowd's fault. It's never the crowd's fault. At least I look at it that way. If I'm not interesting, then, then you're not gonna really learn a whole lot. So I gotta try to be interesting, not sometimes entertaining, uh, but that's sometimes by accident too. Um, all right. So, all right, so read me Bible version. There's a lot of things that, that can cause divisions in a church. And I, I think it breaks God's heart when we fight about the wrong things, you know, when, when we're not passionate about, when we're, I guess, more concerned about what song's being sung or what color the carpet is than we are about whether somebody's gonna get saved that Sunday. And I really believe when we come into church, we need to pray that way. God, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, 
let just let them come let them come to know you. Um, our prayer, and I try to our staff the same way is if there's somebody that needs just a couple extra minutes of our time, you know, as pastors, we pray that God just show me who needs a little bit of extra love today because we don't know where everybody's at when they come into these doors, you know, a lot of people are having a hard time in life and, um, and we need to be open to, to who just needs a little bit of extra love that day because God wants to use you. He really does. Um, and it's, it's a cool thing to do. So I, I personally want to come to church to be a blessing to somebody else. Um, we have our pastor conference tomorrow and the next day. And, um, and I go there and, and I just try to be a blessing to somebody to just, because I know a lot of a lot of the pastors are struggling. You know, the churches um, were actually one of our lar- the larger churches in our in our district, um, one of the assemblies of God. And and there's a lot of pastors who were were, were used to be working another job, and and they just need somebody to say, hey, you're going to make it. You know, um, our church we are so blessed. I mean, our church, Russ is, he's been in a lot of churches. Our church we get along, and that's it's 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 kind of an uncommon thing that we just like each other. Um, of course, the ones that don't like me leave, but um, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but we do have a very good church, and and that comes from the top. It comes from our staff. Our staff we all like each other, and um, you know, very very blessed to have such an easy church to pastor. It really is because I go to these meetings, and they're talking about the board fighting and control and power and and I'm going <laughs> I don't have that because <laughs> just you know one thing that my dad taught me because um, my dad had been on a lot of church boards was he said learn how to take a no he said when your board says no on something just say okay okay because that's why you have a board I don't want to be the no I, I'm the pastor I'm going to say yes and now if it's something that I'm like I feel this is God I've never had our board shut it down Okay, but when you can just take a no, you, I, I, we have guys on our board that I trust and I respect, um, and I, I respect their opinion. And when they don't feel right about something, then we don't do it. Even if I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And, and then my majority of them are like, yeah, they're hearing something I'm not hearing, and that's okay. So it's just a, it's a cool thing that my dad taught me on just how to respect the leadership that I have over me um, in a church board. So it's a good deal. Um, okay, so uh, it doesn't mean that someone's less of a Christian if they don't live your personal convictions. And that, that's, that's something that we all struggle with because we're a little more judgy than we think, right? I mean, I'll tell you what, if I see somebody with, you know, like a, a Rock Harbor or Stonehill or Calvary Chapel sticker and they're bombing down the road, like way driving crazy, I get a little judgy. I'm like, whoa, I should take a picture of your car and send it to your pastor. And, uh, um, you know, maybe that is the pastor, who knows? Uh, my, yeah, he's, he's late for something. Um, but uh, but I, we can we can be a little judgmental, and I think we're just wired that way for some reason. And you know we can uh, judge someone for you know having a bad day instead of saying, "Hey, why is your day bad?" We judge them for having a bad day yeah. instead of saying, "Okay, there's a symptom here, but what is the real problem?" Yeah. Okay, what is the real problem? Um, okay, we must be careful with other people's faith. Okay, their, their faith is fragile, it's weak. They have the mentality, okay, and here's what I think Paul is referring to. They, they have the mentality they still need to do something to gain God's favor and love, okay? They feel like they need to do what's right, they need to not eat me, they need to, to do this. And we need to be careful with people's faith. We really do. I, I think sometimes we overstep people's faith and, or where their faith is at. Um, somebody's got fragile faith, we need to respect that. And sometimes we need to tell them, suck it up. <laughs> Other times we need to say, hey, it's okay. You know, you're, you're, just, you're gonna struggle a little bit, uh, especially if somebody was taught something their whole life. Um, if somebody's coming out of, you know, LDS church, you know, where, boy, you don't drink caffeine, you don't do this. And, and as a Christian, when they get saved, you don't say, hey, have a Coke. They're like, well, no, I, well if, they, if, they, if they hesitate because they've been told their whole life you shouldn't do that, we can't be forced sitting on them. Okay, it, it's not this thing. You can just say, hey, you know, I'm gonna drink one. And if they, if they start freaking out, quit drinking in front of them. Um, but we still have to respect their upbringing. And I think a lot of times we don't. Uh, we need to respect people that grew up in homes that were abusive, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, I probably shared this before. Most of you probably haven't heard it because it's been a while. But I, I was encouraged, <laughs> I'll, I'll use the word encouraged, by some people in our church years back that I needed to be more lively when I preached. They wanted a little more Southern Baptist jump up and yell and Harlan and, you know, um, you know me, I'm just not, I'm kind of an even-killed person. Um, 
I'm not a screamer or a shouter. And, and so I tried to amp it up a little bit, you know, drink a little extra coffee, um, which you guys typically know when that happened. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I thought, well, I want to be interesting. And, and, but, I, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, let me just say, I wasn't born to be a black preacher. I love black preachers. I'm jealous of black preachers because they can preach the house down, right? They have the gift. They just do. Um, I'm just a short white guy. <laughs> I don't have that gift, but but somehow God gifted black preachers just to, to I, mean, I don't think I've ever heard one that was boring, you know? Um, of course, they have a lot of people amen and them on. Um, so the crowd does, there we go. Hallelujah, brother. <laughs> I'm telling you today, a little shaky voice. Um, because the Holy Spirit comes down when you shake your voice a little bit. It's got to fluctuate. <laughs> and so, I, anyway, as I, 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 I was encouraged to be a little more lively in my preaching and whatever. And I tried it. And I'm like, that's just not me. There's days that I will get excited and whatnot. Um, and uh, now I wish I could tell you why I told you the story. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I was going somewhere with it. Um, it was entertainment. It was. It was just. I guess what other people expected of me, and and it just wasn't me. You know. I mean, I want to be interesting, obviously. Um, but uh, anyhow, I <laughs> I really wanted to tell you why I told you that because I was going somewhere with it. But that's okay. I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm just like I forgot. That's okay. Um, it'll hit me about halfway through the study tonight. I, I will. I'll remember. Um, and maybe God's like, no, you're not supposed to tell him. But I don't. I think it's just my memory. It wasn't bad. It was just maybe expectations of other people. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I can't remember where I was going. I need to watch the. Maybe go watch the replay. Then I'll know where I was going with the conversation. Um, all right. Well, let's just continue. Beans, I can't remember my point, <laughs> which is going to drive me crazy now. But that's all right. Um, okay, five and six, the Sabbath day. Okay, the Sabbath day. Um, the big thing on the Sabbath day is lordship. Guys, it does not matter what day you go to church, okay? In the Jewish culture, it did. This Saturday was their, that was their deal. And there are churches today that believe the Saturday is the Sabbath. Well, technically, yes, okay? But if you're gonna obey the Sabbath and follow Jewish law, you better follow all the other Jewish laws. You can't just pick and choose what laws you want to follow. Uh, you know, again, did you drive to church? <laughs> did you prepare breakfast? Okay, you go, might go to church on, on Saturday, but you better follow the other laws too, otherwise you're breaking other Sabbaths. So we like to kind of build our own little idea of what holiness and righteousness is. Um, it doesn't matter what day you go to church. It doesn't. As long as you go, it's a lordship thing. Um, you know, we have church on Sunday uh, because that's the day we believe that the Lord rose. Um, but the big thing is, again, lordship. He's our savior and the Lord. And again, in verses five and six, we see uh, three times in verse six, to the Lord, okay? To the Lord, to the Lord. Uh, we aren't supposed to live our convictions to please other people, but Jesus. And, and I think sometimes we do. I think sometimes we live our convictions to try to look more spiritual, to try to look like, hey, I'm serving God. Um, you know, I, one thing that I, mean, I think I wrote down here, yeah, don't try to convince me you love Jesus. If you, really, if you truly live for him, I'll be convinced that you love him. You don't have to tell me how much you love God and all this stuff. And um, it's just one of those things that some people feel like they have to tell you how much they love God and, and they got the bumper stickers and they got the, all the Jesus stuff and the t-shirts and all that. Uh, I would rather just have a, a person that lives it that has to tell me. Now, I think we should have it on our shirt. I think we should have our Change Life shirts on. Why? Because we represent, you better behave when you do, right? right? Uh, be cutting people off. Um, and one of, one of the things I'd like to do this, this year, um, as we're getting to our Vision Sunday, is, is to be more visible um, as a church family, you know, whether it's serve days where we go mow people's yards or just do something with a, a Change Life shirt on so that people know, because people have this idea that churches are takers, like they just want, they want. But when you have an idea of giving, okay, uh, that's a big deal. And Brian, he knows a lot about that because working at the Dream Center, it's about giving, okay? The churches that he worked at, the Dream Centers, they were known for what they did for the community, not for what they took. So I, I need to sit down with Brian because he knows a lot more than I do about that and what that would look like. But that's my heart for our church is that we not be an ingrown toenail, but that's a bad example, but an outgrown, yeah, something beautiful. Um, 
And I know Brian's heart's like that, and he's got a lot of experience on how to, how to have a good reputation. And we do, our church actually has a good reputation in our town, um, but I want it to be better. I want it to be better. I want it to be more visible that we're living out our Christianity, okay? Living it out. It's really important. Um, okay, so verse seven. If I could see it. There it is. Okay. For none of us lives to himself alone. And none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we die to the Lord. Uh, bottom of page one, what you do doesn't just affect you. How often do we miss that? That what, that what I do, my behavior doesn't just affect me. It affects other people. Uh, decisions have a ripple effect. You know, have you ever seen a really still water? You throw one rock in, what happens? The ripples go all the way. You ever been in a boat, in a bigger boat went by? <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. I have a 12 foot aluminum boat and I don't like it when big boats go by because it just sh shakes you all over. You know, there's always a bigger boat. But we, our decisions have ripple effects, okay? So uh, the challenge here from me to you, to me to myself, is beware of decisions you make or don't make that have the potential to impact someone's life in a significant way. In other words, think before you act, okay? Adam and Eve did not think things through. Okay, and, and we got to give them a little grace because there hadn't really been consequences yet in the Garden of Eden. They had never sinned. They had never done anything wrong. So they really didn't know that, hey, what I do is going to have a negative effect. All they knew is God said, don't eat that fruit. And they did it. And there wasn't even a warning. Okay, there wasn't a slap on the hand. There wasn't, hey, don't do it again. It was, you're out. <laughs> you're out. And they were out of the Garden of Eden. There was a flaming or a the angel of the flaming sword so they couldn't get back in and eat of the tree of life because if they ate from the tree of life, they would live forever in their state and it would be their state of deadness, basically. Um, crazy thing. And I, I often wonder, or have wondered, I should say, is, is the tree of life, where did it go? I mean, you know, where the Euphrates River, it's in Iraq is where they figured, Euphrates, there's four rivers, um, the Euphrates, the Tigris, the, the Pihon and the Gihon, I believe, were the four rivers that go through the Garden of Eden. Um, so they have a general location of where the Garden Eden was. Now it's pretty much all desert. Um, but the tree of life, you wonder how long did it stay there and bear fruit before it just croaked? It, it might be in another dimension, yeah. There's definitely, in heaven, there's the trees of life. So it's going be cool. All right, page two. Um, in your notes, if you don't want your kids, I told you this Sunday, if you don't want your kids to struggle with it, you shouldn't be doing with it. You shouldn't be doing it. Easier said than done, but a good goal Nonetheless, again, the question, I can, but should I? The big question is, is am I setting a good example in what I allow myself to do? And I think that's what Paul's really trying to say here is, is there's some things that are okay, but there's some things that aren't that great of an example, okay? And, and maybe you only know in your life what that looks like. Like, what is it that, that maybe you allow yourself to do, but is not a great example? Um, I can't speak for you, but I know the things in my life. Um, it's, it's what I say, you know, it's either sarcasm or it's words that are just a little rude, not cuss words, but they're, you know, they're Christian cuss words. <laughs> uh, yeah, how, you know, how, how we say stuff. Um, am I setting a good example of what I allow myself to do? Um, only you can answer that. Well, no, that's not true. I could tell you. <laughs> All right. I work with your children. Okay, let me ask you this. If you cook something and you leave the pots and pans on the stove and don't wash them, is that a good example? No. Yeah. Some people don't care, but for me, <laughs> in my house, don't do that. If you, if you cook it, clean it, right? Then there's certain things that you just should do. If you drilling holes and in in doing something for your wife and, you know, hanging shelves, but you just leave all your tools in the kitchen, no. it's not a good example, right? There's just, there's things that we do. Um, again, personal conviction. All right, verse 8. Let's keep going before I start meddling and get in trouble. All right. Verse 8. Okay, well, I read that. Oh, actually, no, we need to deal with that. Okay, so we, we talked about it. Um, whether you live or die, you die to the Lord. Uh, we do everything as unto the Lord. That, that, is a, that will set you free. It is hard because there are times. It says whatever, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Uh, there's also a verse that says that whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Because a lot of times, at least in my life, I have these expectations of getting a thank you, like, or at least appreciation of some sort, not groveling at your feet for eternity, you know. Um, I, I 
tend to be a thankful person. I notice when people do stuff most of the time, and I try to be thankful. Um, but when we do things as unto the Lord, um, let me just read what I wrote. This attitude will set you free from disappointment in how others react or don't react to what we do for them. Because all of us do stuff for people that doesn't get noticed or rarely gets noticed. I would say one of the biggest reasons that um, marriages fail is lack of appreciation. Because when, when you feel somebody appreciates you, you'll stick around, right? I mean, that's, we love to feel appreciated, even if it's just a small thank you or, hey, I noticed you did that, thanks. Um, I don't think we ever get tired of somebody telling us, hey, thanks, you did a good job with that, you know, or I appreciate what you did. And so when you have two people that show that appreciation, there's really no reason to leave. You know what? how affairs typically start? They don't typically start in sexuality. They, they, they typically start with a thank you or appreciation. There's a feeling there, a lot of times non-sexual, but it's an appreciate, they, they appreciate me. They notice. My wife never notices, but she noticed. And, um, you know, and, then it, and then it goes downhill from there. Um, the same in and, and, and the reverse as well. But God, he appreciates what we do. Okay? The question is, do we appreciate what he did every day? You see, when I live for Jesus, I am living in appreciation of what he did for me. That's why it's so important to remember every, every morning that, boy, you got a second chance at life. That God, God forgave you, and he gave you a second chance. And he's given us thousands of second chances. You know why there are only second chances? Because he just forgets the first time that he forgave you. He's like, okay, it's, the mercy's new. So that when you blow it, it's the second chance. God doesn't go, oh, three, four, five. You know how I know God doesn't do that is because he chooses just to forgive and forget. Okay? That's a choice thing. All right? um, again, it's, it's a weird thing how he can forget like that. You know, can God make himself forget things? Is he so powerful he can make himself forget? Well, I think he just chooses to. Okay? I wish I was that graceful. All right. So anyhow, this attitude, do anything under the Lord will set you free from disappointment and how others react or don't react to what we do for them. Uh, do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. And I want to go to 1 Corinthians here, chapter 10. It's not too far from Romans. So go forward. Let's see, about 1168. Oh, mine's not very many pages. Mine's like four pages. Um, Here's one screen away, one, yeah, one swipe, That's, that, that would work too. All right, 1 Corinthians 10, 23. If you know anything about 10 code, please code 10, 23 means I've arrived. <laughs> so when you get to a scene, you'll say 10, 23 means I'm here. Um, none of us has arrived, okay, in, in our Christian walk with God. All right, First, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Again, this is Paul talking. Okay, now he's writing to the Corinthians. Okay, eat anything sold in the meat market. So he had a pro He was writing to Rome. He's like, okay, the Corinthians have the same issue, so I gotta tell y'all again. Um, eat anything in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you wanna go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. Okay, in other words, if they, if they serve you pork chops, <laughs> he's like, just don't ask where it came from, just eat it, enjoy it. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered, to, offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience's sake, um, the other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. Uh, for why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? Okay, if I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced for something I thank God for? So whether, and here's, here's the, the key verse. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Uh, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I'm not seeking my own, but the good of many, so that many may be saved. And then he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So again, he deals with it with the Corinthians. Um, I wrote here in, in uh, halfway down page two. If God's word isn't clear about what you're feeling, Pray about it and go with your God-given instinct, okay? Go with the God-given instinct. Just say, okay, God, if I'm, gonna, I'm not hearing from you. I think I'm supposed to do this. I'm gonna do it. If you don't want me to do it, shut the door hard. Like, slam it. I don't, I ask, I've never asked God to shut the door quietly on, okay, should I do this, should I not? I want him to throw the door open <laughs> or slam it shut. I don't want this little, is that the door? <laughs> what was that? Okay. Um, there's some doors I think God doesn't care which, where you walk through. 
I think God says, oh, there's lots of doors, go ahead. You know, as long as it's not defiling the word and defiling you, I don't care where you eat tonight. You know, Russ had a good example. Like, you don't have to pray about every restaurant. <laughs> what do you feel like? Chilies? <laughs> go and then go, all right? You don't have to. I know some people like that. They pray about like every little thing. And I'm like, I don't think God cares about what you eat for dinner. He might for you, but I think God gave you an appetite and he gave you cravings for a reason, right? Eat, eat whatever restaurant you want to eat. Um, I, I think it's okay to pray because maybe God has somebody, you know, for you to talk to, but all right. So I wrote this. If, if you have to ask yourself, should I be doing this? <laughs> yeah, then there's a good chance you shouldn't be, especially if you say it in the tone of voice that I said it in. Should I be doing this? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe not. I would say for the most part, if you have to ask yourself in that tone of voice, there's a good chance that you shouldn't be doing this. Um, at the same time, I have, had, I have asked myself that question, should I be doing this? When it's like fishing. Like, I feel guilty because I've, you know, yeah, yeah, or sleeping in. It, it, you know, maybe I work six days, you know. I mean, this week, this particular week, it'll be, I don't know how many days with church because we have the conference. Normally, Friday is our staff day off, but we have conference Thursday, Friday. So it'll be probably 10, yeah, I came in Monday. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> still got to get ready for Sunday. So I'll probably have been at church probably 10 days in a row or 10 church, church stuff. Um but that's okay. There's some weeks that are like that. You got night meetings. You all got all kinds of things. Um, and uh, anyways, you just do what needs to be done. And then there's times when you slow down and it's like, I don't have anything to do tonight. I feel guilty. It's like, should I sit in my new chair and get a back rub? Heck yeah. All right. This is a gift from my wife. I'm going to sit in it and I'm not going to feel guilty at all. Um, I was in it this afternoon when I, because I have to go in for a couple hours to get my brain retrained for Bible study. And it was lovely, all right? The Bible is consistent, okay? And you will see patterns modeled for our behaviors, okay? There's patterns throughout the whole Bible as to what's right and what's wrong. We don't usually have to guess, okay? God is consistent. Um, so Jesus, verse 9 through 10, is Lord over everything. Back, I think I jumped back to Romans. Um, yeah, that's my fault. All right, so, okay, 9 through 10, all right, for this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that both the dead and the living, I'm sorry, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. As it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. Every, every person's gonna bow. All right, so Jesus is Lord of everything in your notes. Um, he's in control of the planet and the afterlife. Uh, because of this, don't set yourself up on the judge's bench with a gavel, okay? Judging others on gray areas is dangerous. Now, we can judge fruit, okay, because we're supposed to. We're supposed to judge fruit. Um, for the Christian, uh, this judgment seat here is called the Bema seat. It's not the great white throne judgment. It's the Bema seat, and that's the, the seat that in the Olympics, in the Roman times, that the Bema seat is where the the judges would hand the crowns to the winners, like the victors. So, so that's the, the, when you look in the, the Greek and Hebrew, or Greek in this case, that's the seat he's talking about, okay? You're not the one that gets to hand out rewards or, mer or demerits, the bad things, but God do that, okay? So he's not saying you don't be judged. I mean, obviously, we're not to judge people as, as far as saying you're going to hell or whatever. Um, I'm probably really confusing you because I'm a little bit confused because I'm talking too much. You all look at me like, yeah. Um, does this make sense? So Bema seat, rewards, okay? Um, and he's just saying here, don't be judgy with a gavel and don't be judgy with saying somebody's, you know, should get their crown taken away because they did something wrong in your opinion because it's against your conviction and not theirs. Um, so we have, to, I just have to be careful. Yeah, the, the fruit, judging fruit, all right? Um, Okay, so we can judge fruit, okay? For the Christian, this judgment, again, is the reward seat, not whether or not you're going and getting into heaven. Uh, I told you that to tell you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 9 through 13. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 9. Okay, let's talk about sexual morality here. You wanna talk about a hard line? Okay, here's what he says. Because I've got blasted before when I discussed sexual morality, and uh, people don't think I'm very Christ-like when I do it, but I just tell you what the Bible says. 
right? I'm not worried about it when people blast me for it. Here's what Paul says. He says, I have written you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or of the greedy of the swindlers, idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother okay, or a Christian, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. And people think I'm bad. <laughs> Paul is taking a pretty hard line here with people who are like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they're all sleeping around, all right? Or they're getting plastered. Um, he says this, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Okay, right there. That's okay. Because people say, well, you're, you know, you're not supposed to judge, not lest you be judged. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible does say you will be judged in the way that you judge. But Paul's here saying that we are to make judgments, okay? I cannot preach against things without consider or without coming across judgmental, right? If I, if I preach and say, hey, you know, fornication is wrong. You're sleeping together. You're not married. You shouldn't be doing that. Well, you're just being judgmental. Well, according to the law, I'm just relaying the message, okay? Uh, we, we can bring curses on ourselves, all right? Um, there's certain sins that we can commit that they don't, they don't make us unsaved, Okay, it's sinful, and as a as a pastor, it's my job to confront. It's my, it's my job to say, "Hey, bro, come on, man! You're only hurting yourself if you're going to live this way." Um, and I think, as brothers and sisters, we have to look out for each other. Okay, there there should be times that you look at me and go, eh, "I'm not sure. You probably shouldn't have said that, or you probably shouldn't be doing that." You know. Um, Hopefully, my life's enough together that I don't have to have people come and tell me you shouldn't be doing that because I know what the Word of God says. Um, most of my trouble gets, I most, of, most of my trouble comes from here. <laughs> it comes from what I say, like um, not really what I do, but what I say. But he does say, we're, are we not to judge those inside? And he doesn't mean, okay, because he says this, God will judge those outside, but expel the wicked man among you. Um, how often do we do this in church? How often do I have the ushers come and get you, you know, out of a church service and say, oh, we know what you did last week. <laughs> you got to get out of the church until you get right. We don't do that, right? We're, we're graceful. Well, Paul here is, I'm not sure you want Paul to be your pastor, okay? He'd be all up in your business school and uh, yeah, it's like, whoa. But, but they're saying, what he's saying here is, is take sin seriously. Um, and Paul, there was another guy, he said, I handed him over to Satan, just to, teach, just to save his soul. He said, I love him so much that I handed him over to Satan. Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty hard line here. Where he's like, don't even eat with somebody who is claiming that they're a brother and they're living in this sexual sin or drunkenness, but they don't care. That's the thing. It's not that you're struggling with drunk. It's not you're struggling with addiction. God knows that you struggle with stuff. But if you understand the struggle and you're trying to get out of it, that's, God's proud of you for that. He knows your physical body is addicted to certain things. Um, what, what he's talking about here is somebody who says, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to live however the heck I want, and I, and I'm, and I get to go ahead. That's the attitude he's talking about, okay? Not just somebody struggling with something, but somebody living in blatant sin um, and not caring what God's word says about it, feeling no conviction, no, um, no reason to get right, or no desire to get right, I should say. Does that make sense? Okay. Now that we're through that, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, Jesus, again, um, he's Lord over everything. So, all right, motive matters, motive matters. It really does. When we call people on their stuff, our motive is really important. If I call you out on something because I love you and I want your life to be better, that's not judging, okay? But if I call you out on something because I wanna look better than you, that's judging, okay? So we have to be very careful with that. All right, uh, bottom of page two, the weaker Christian tends to be more judgmental toward the Christian who has more liberty in what they allow themselves to do, okay? And the one with a stronger faith tends to despise the one who is judging him. <laughs> Neither is good, right? Neither is good. So the, the strong faith person is like, dude, quit judging me. And the, the weak faith person is like, well, you're sinning, you're eating meat and you're doing this and doing that. Uh, Paul, again, he's just saying, guys, let's focus on the main thing. Let's not get carried away by the crazy stuff that, that can get us off track as to what our mission is. Okay, Paul reminds us that judgment is coming, okay, page three, and we will all have to give an account of our lives. In the same way you judge, you will be judged. Again, motive matters. The problem with many preachers these days is that they avoid talking about sin altogether 
uh, so as to be liked and not be offensive. And there's more, I think, in these days, there's, uh, well, I'm going to keep reading. As a leader, I can't be more concerned with your feelings than I am telling you the truth that can help you or save you. And I wrote here, feelings first. <laughs> you remember earth first? If you guys have been around, uh, that was something we fought in the logging industry was, was earth first. Um, and they would destroy logging equipment. My dad, they did some sabotaging to my dad's stuff. Um, but here, here I put down feelings first. If as your pastor, I go feelings first, I have to care about your feelings, I'm never gonna tell you what you need to hear. I, I'm not gonna send a, a, a copy of my sermon notes to every member of the church and say, okay, will you guys look through these because I'm gonna preach on Sunday, but if there's nothing you don't like, just go ahead and send. I'd get blank pieces of paper back, right? <laughs> or, or Jesus loves you. Okay, that's it. You don't have to change. Um, honestly, right? If I sent it out to everybody, I would get, a, I mean, everybody would go, oh, yeah, take this out, take this out, take this out. Um, it's not my job to to be a political pastor to try to gain favor by telling you what you want to hear. That's an easy way to, to build a fast growing church is you just tell everybody what they want to hear. Paul even talks about that, you know, just telling people what their itching ears want to hear. Um, I can tell you a lot about God's love, but I have to tell you about God's wrath too, right? I mean, it's more fun to preach God's love. It's more fun to preach the fluffy stuff, but the, the hard stuff, you know, like somebody's going to get offended here. And if I'm in it for the likes, Okay, if I'm in it for the popularity, I'm in, I'm in it for the, hey, great fluffy sermon today, pastor. I didn't get convicted. You know, you did a good job. I can still live how I want. Uh, I'm not a good pastor. If as a parent, you never confront your kids on their behavior, they have no reason to change. It makes you a bad parent, okay? It, it is. It's bad parenting when we don't confront our kids. We have to. We have to say, hey, your behavior stinks. You need to go in another direction. All right, I cannot be afraid. Um, and, and I'll tell you this, when I was younger in ministry, I had this fear of giving altar calls. My fear was that nobody would raise their hand for salvation. That was the fear. Well, what if, what, because I took it like as personal rejection. <laughs> okay, okay, well, if nobody gets saved, then, you know, it, it'd be like a fisherman going, I'm not gonna cast because I, I don't wanna, you know, if I come up empty and a fish doesn't bite, it makes me a bad fisherman, so I'm not even gonna throw the bait out there. That would be crazy, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I, yeah, you don't throw your bite, you're probably not gonna catch a fish, you know? I've had, I've never had a fish jump into my boat before. Um, I have had people want to get saved without me really laying it all out. Like, I need to know Jesus, how do I do this? That happens, not very often. And I started realizing, you know, if I don't give a simple gospel message, then there might be one person that doesn't know how to get saved. And I don't think anybody should leave a church service not knowing how to get right with Jesus. I, I just, I, I think that's an injustice um, because, you know, like my wife might've said it because um, she says some cool stuff was, it might be their last ditch effort to know if God's real. They might show up and go, okay, God, if you're real, you know, and if I don't present a clear gospel message and they walk out of here not having known, that's, a, that's on me. That, that's a sad thing. Um, you know, our, our church, I want our church to have hope. And um, I, uh, I to talked to a young lady today um, just through through Facebook and, um, it just, it's just one of those things to where some people have a view of church, like that everybody's perfect and got their lives together. I'm like, I know them, they don't, all right? We're all messed up, you know? What sort of messed up are you? Um, we're all messed up at one point or another. We're all struggling together. And, we're all, and, and we all have things that, you know, that we don't want anybody to know about. We have thought, whether it's a thought or an action, um, because we're just kind of messed up humans, okay? But we're trying, and that's what God is proud of, is that we're actually trying. Um, it's one thing, you know, I've, I've, I've learned this, that a kid does not care, a kid doesn't get mad at you for telling them their room is dirty. They have no problem with you telling them their room is dirty. It's when you tell them to clean it up is when they have the issue, okay? Because <laughs> you can walk by, hey, your room's dirty, you yeah, know, and not say nothing. They don't get offended at that. They get offended when you're like, clean it up. Well, as a pastor, I have to say, hey, your room's dirty, but work on it, okay? Because we all, yeah, the room's dirty, and I don't have to change. No, I'm just pointing out a fact. Well, God wants us to have clean rooms. He wants us to do the best we can to try to live, um, you know, with, with fewer sins um, as we mature. So, all right, let's keep rolling. Okay, surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess. Um, I wrote here, sooner or later, every knee will bow. 
and confess that Jesus is Lord, bow now while it still matters. Because once you breathe your last breath, that decision is final. You, you don't, don't be saying, well, I'm just gonna get saved on my deathbed. <laughs> That's not, you probably won't have a deathbed thing. You know, it's gonna be, it's gonna come when you don't, don't expect it. All right. Um, okay, so every knee will bow. All right, we will give an account to God on how we lived our lives. We do, uh, forgiven sin won't be held against us. That is so cool that, again, that as a Christian, you won't be judged for, for forgiven sins, okay? The judgment comes on how you lived, okay? The, but Revelation talks about books, the book of life, but then there's a book of works. Um, let me tell you something. Some of you, I'm gonna say all of you, every single one of you are going to be shocked at some of the things that you get rewarded for that you forgot you did or didn't even realize that you did. Some of the good things that you were just living Jesus and you weren't trying to live Jesus, you just were because you love Jesus, you helped people, you took somebody's cart, you helped maybe a mom that's you know, had a baby. Because I always, if a mom's putting a kid in the car seat, I, I see the dilemma. I wanna put my cart back, but I don't wanna leave my kid. There's this whole thing. And I always try to pay attention and grab the cart from them, especially if there's still groceries in a purse. Um, I'm just kidding. No, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but honestly, mark my words, I really believe that, that you're gonna get more rewards than you think. Okay, just because you did things out of kind heartedness that you just, you didn't realize it was that big of a deal, but to God, it was a big deal. To God, it was a big deal. Um, I don't know if you saw my, my video I posted. Uh, I guess it was yesterday. This whole week is kind of blurry, but um, and it's only Wednesday. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that was Monday. I guess it was Monday where I was coming back. I helped a gal with her car. And um, so I was on I-84. And it was almost to the 10-mile road. And I, I saw a car with a flat the hazard lights on, and I usually try to pay attention to what's happening. So I drove by and uh, tire just shredded in. And so I didn't, couldn't tell if it was a male or a female. Usually if it's a guy, I'm like, tough luck, you should know how to change your own tire. Um, but uh, if it's a woman and I could tell like, cause, she, I, cause I keep jack and all my tire changing tools in my pickup. And so anyways, so I drove by and I drove a little further and I went, yeah, I better stop. And I was already an eighth of a mile probably past. So I put my hazard lights on. I mean, people were just, so I backed all the way up and I got out and she had AAA coming, you know, and so her tires just shredded. And she's like, I hope I didn't break my car because <laughs> she drove a long ways on it. Um, I said, well, you kind of destroyed the tire. <laughs> but, um, but in my video, I, I, she was the sweetest girl. She was probably 23, um, just bubbly, not like, oh, this stinks. My, you know, she was just, just super kind, like, you know, and, and so I was like, well, I could change it for you. And she goes, well, they're on Garrity, uh, you know, the tow truck's coming. And so I, I did, I got her name, but I forgot her name. And I told her I passed her to church. I didn't want to freak her out. Like I passed her to church out in CUNA, give her enough information that I'm not a creeper. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, I stood there for a little while longer and, and, uh, and she said they were almost there. So um, anyhow, I, she goes, can I give you a hug? <laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> I said, give her a hug. And, um, and she's a pretty gal. So I, t I texted Travis. I said, if you'd have been with me, I'd have found you a wife. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but her, her personality blessed me. I mean, I drove away and my only regret was I said, you want me to stay here with you till they get here? She's like, oh no. You know, I think she didn't want to be inconvenienced. And I, I drove away and I went, I should have just stayed. Again, I don't want to be creeper. Like, oh, I'm going to hang around. Um, because I kind of worried about her the rest of the day. Like, I hope the tow truck showed up because sometimes they don't. They're like, yeah, we're there, but they're just trying to get business so they're further out. Um, and uh, anyway, but I, I got home and then I started realizing that my shirt smelled like perfume. If you didn't uh -huh. watch my video. So I went, I smell like another woman. And so I had to explain to my wife. <laughs> I walked up to her. I said, I smell like another woman. And <laughs> she kind of like looks at me like, what? <laughs> explain the situation. Um, she just laughed it off, and um, but I was. The thing is, it was that I wished I wished I knew. She actually told me where she lived. Chris and I actually drove down like the street where the, she said she lived on, um, because uh, we were just going to buy her a new tire. But I was so impressed with the fact that I mean, I stopped to help her again. I didn't know if it was a male or female when I stopped, but she left an imprint on me of just a positive, I mean, I, I'm guessing she's a Christian. I mean, how her bubbliness or just her thankfulness, but she was so thankful that I would even stop to help, you know, um, just, it was just this cool little interaction. Um, and then I, I had obviously her perfume on my shirt 
And I thought, you know, we, we leave a fragrance with people when we come into contact with them. We leave a fragrance of some sort. We leave an impact, an impression. Um, and this young woman left a bigger impression on me for her, just her positive outlook on things and her friendliness and thankfulness. You don't see that a lot with that age group, um, you know. And so she probably had really good parents, I'm guessing. Um, but I just thought, and that, it's just something that I learned that, wow, I stopped to help, but she actually encouraged me to be more like Jesus, you know, to people. When we come into contact with people, that we leave a fragrance um, with somebody. Um, so anyhow, who knows? My Travis is like, did you get a number? <laughs> that would be a creeper, all right? <laughs> you got this 49-year-old guy. Hey, can I have your number? Um, yeah, it's from my son. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, if it's meant to be, then he'll meet her somewhere, right? Um, but anyhow, but she is the type of gal that you would go, she, she, would, she would be a good wife for your son. Um, at least in the short five minutes, yeah. <laughs> um, but again, the whole point was, I, I think God was teaching me something. You know, we, we, we try to help when we can. And, and in the process, um, we leave a fragrance with somebody. And I don't want to be the type of Christian that Paul is warning these people about, that they're f- afraid to tell you what they're going through because they, they think you're going to be judgy. I want the kind of church family, and I think we have this, that we can say, man, I'm struggling with this. I had a bad day or bad attitude. I did this, did that, thinking this, I'm addicted to this, I'm struggling with this addiction, um, that we love each other through it. And that, that's the kind of family that I'm, I'm thankful that we have um, at our church. Um, because again, we're all, we're all some sort of messed up. Um, and God just wants to, he wants to help us in this journey. So, all right, well, let's keep going because we're gonna finish this because I always get blamed for not finishing because it's true. I just don't, all right? We don't have a whole lot left, all right. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I'm fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. And do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow, okay, here's the verse I was saying. If you just read this and you just left it alone, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) If you just took that verse, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. (laughs) I get plastered every night. Hey, read this verse because, yeah, I consider it good, so you can't consider it evil. No, that's not what it's saying. Okay, verse 17 Okay, again, context is the key. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better to not eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you do, uh, keep, I'm sorry, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. And blessed is the man, this is a huge verse, blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. In other words, sin sometimes doesn't feel like sin. Okay, I can approve something, go, hey, that's fine with me. But if the Bible says absolutely don't do it, you're condemning yourself. And so he, Paul's saying here, you've got a lot of freedoms, but don't condemn yourself by what you approve. But the man who da- has doubts is condemned if he, if he eats because his eating is not from faith and everything that is not from faith is sin. Okay, so in your notes, bottom page three, don't be a hindrance in someone else's life. Um, again, if, you were, if what you were okay with causes someone else to stumble, you're not acting in love, don't do it. Okay, this scenario, okay, if you're eating with a group, don't eat a steak that your friend knows was sacrificed to a pagan god if it trips them out. <laughs> like, don't eat that. Okay, bro, you know, just doggy bag, eat it later. So our goal tonight is to be a help and not a hindrance. That's a big deal. Be a help and not a hindrance. Uh, Keep the main thing the main thing, page four. Uh, Keep some things between you and God, okay? Obviously not clear biblical sin, okay? Some things, again, you and God, that's that's, that's cool. Blessed is a man, again, does not condemn himself by what he approves. That is a big deal to me. Uh, Just because it's wrong, or I'm sorry, just because it doesn't feel wrong doesn't mean it isn't wrong. I wrote here, I've met plenty of people who live in sin who are having a good time. 
okay? Just because it feels wrong or it doesn't feel wrong doesn't mean it isn't wrong. We have to, to judge it according to the word of God. Um, and then the last thing here, this isn't for me. I heard, I heard a pastor say this. He said, living in obedience to God isn't necessarily the same thing as living to please God. And then I added, you can obey with attitude <laughs> because you can. Um, and God just wants us to, to have, again, faith and to keep the main thing the main thing to not force my convictions on anybody, um, but at the same time to be able to lead. And, and that's the balance. That's why I titled the things the way I did tonight is to find that balance of convictions, but not pushing my convictions on you, but at the same time challenging people to be holy. You know, it's okay to tell your kids, hey, don't be cussing. Okay, it's okay to say that. It is. Now, if they don't live in your home anymore and they come to your house and they like to cuss, you could say, I don't want you cussing at my house, okay? Right. So, anyhow. All right. Pastor John is going to lead us in a couple of songs. Yeah. There we go. Now you got the reverb cranked. You might want to turn that down. Check. Good and loud. Find the reverb. <laughs> hey, there we go. Evening. Hey, we're going to sing the way. Do every battle. Come on. Do every setting our eyes on you tonight. It's a new horizon, 
And I'm set on you as you meet me here today. The mercies out of new, all my fears and doubts, they can all come to you because they can't stay long. When I believe that you are the way, so Lord, you are the truth, the lie. I believe that you are the way, the truth, the lie. I believe that you are. Yes, Lord Jesus. We believe that because it's in your word. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. Lord Jesus, we call on your holy and your precious name tonight. Lord, thank you for your precious grace. my heart twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed yes Lord Jesus my chains are gone my chains are gone, and I've been set free. And my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Our chains are gone, cause my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun and forbear to shine but God who called be here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine. Yes, so my chains are. My chains are gone. Yeah, I've been set free. And my God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing. 
grace, unending love, amazing grace, unending love, amazing grace. And just to close our time tonight, just let this serve as our close. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once, cause I once was lost, but now I'm found and was blind, but now. I see. Yes, Lord. No better prayer than that. God's people said. Amen. 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 Thanks for singing. Thanks for coming, friends. We'll see you Sunday.